Welcome back to Supreme Myths. Today I have on, um, well, a, a fantastically close friend of mine who I really don't know, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, Law Prof Blog joins us today. I'm going to call this person LPB as we go on because that's easier to say than Law Prof Blog. LPB is going to remain anonymous, as you can tell, um, and uh, that's very important. Otherwise, the world could end. Uh, so my first question to LPB, first of all, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. I, I, I question your judgment. <laughs> um, so how many Law Review articles has LPB written? LPB has written one law review article, and uh, that was co-authored, and uh, I think my co-author did most of the work, and I just signed my name to it. Uh, this, is, this is something that I, I think we should, uh, I should do more often, is uh, get uh, co-authors to do my work for me. Uh, I, think, I think we all would like that. Um, say again? It's like the blog post you and I wrote, right? You did all the work, and I just put my name on it. It just works out. Great. That is very not true. But for those who don't know, Law Prof Blog and I wrote a blog post for Above the Law. You actually got it published in Above the Law. Um, uh, Pixie for president. Pixie was Judge Richard Posner's cat at the time. Uh, I think both of us agree that we'd still rather have Pixie for president than either Trump or Clinton, which was one of the – is that fair, LPB? I, I, I don't uh, make any sort of representations as to any political parties. Uh, I, 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 I understand that I am supposed to be liberal because I'm a law professor and we're all just so liberal and communist, but I just can't put myself in that position to, to make those kind of judgment calls. That's, that's far beyond my pay grade. Other than wanting Pixie to be president, which you did sign on to. I did, yeah. I, I figured there would be le- uh, fewer catastrophes if, uh, if that were. Begin with, I always ask my guests uh, three myths about something they know about, and we've ranged from the movie industry to originalism to uh, criminal justice. Um, I think the three myths I want to ask you are: what are the what are what are, what are the three myths about being a social media superstar, which is what you are? Myth number one: I'm not a social media superstar. There, there are certainly people who have far more. Uh, meaningful content and make a greater contribution to society than, than I do. Uh, two, uh, in terms of uh, how much uh, recognition you get out of it, it doesn't quite make you rich. It doesn't quite make you famous. And in fact, uh, it, it comes with some mixed feelings uh, for, for people who actually know who I am as to whether I'm doing anything of value or if I'm just wasting my time on Twitter. Uh, the third, the third one is, of course, uh, that uh, when I that I'm anonymous. Uh, I assume when I tweet that anything that at some point something's going to happen and I'm going to be no. So I assume every time I tweet something that it will it will come back to me at some point. Yet a few weeks ago or a month ago somewhere, I suggested on Twitter that I knew who you were which was um, maybe true, maybe not. I'm not saying either way. Um, but I had a bunch of people write me privately, who is this person? Tell us, give us a hint, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, which again, of course, like I would never reveal your secret identity. Um, you are being too modest. You write things for Above the Law. You write things for Law Prof Blog or whatever that blog is. Um, and, and, and you're on Twitter. So you're not, you're not just a Twitter superstar. You have presence elsewhere. And a lot of what you write about has to do with legal education. What's wrong with legal education today, LPB? Well, that seems like a loaded question. I would like to phone a friend. You Uh, like to what? I would like to phone a friend. Um, You know, you can't do that. Oh, okay. Right. Different. Um, well, I, since I'm talking to you, I can't call you. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I might have to call Florida Bar or something. How about Bainbridge out in California? Yeah, he, he disagrees with me on a lot of things, and that's why I really like to I, I, I like to follow Twitter accounts that uh, that challenge me. I don't like to just follow people who agree with me, and it, it's quite easy in my position because almost no one does. Uh, but what's wrong with legal academia? Uh, I think three things. Uh, one, we are 
so wrapped around this notion that we we have to make this measured difference and what we what we do in terms of scholarly impact is our contribution to the world and i think that is misguided because what it suggests is perhaps rather than um you know teaching if i if i actually wrote a blog post that that helps someone get through the bar exam that that would be deeply meaningful contribution if if i write an article that gets cited our 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 academic system suggests that's far more valuable right depending on who cites it and where it's cited so i think this whole notion of measuring stuff is is misguided not the epithet three on that LPB. Um, so I'm much older than you by several decades, probably. And um, when I started law school, I think this is an important conversation. In 1991, when I started law school, it wasn't like that. It really wasn't. Only a privileged few got to be influencers and try to affect public opinion. Because the only way to get known back then was through law review articles that other that elite law professors cited. And of course, if you're not in an elite law school, that was tough. Um, but that was the only avenue, maybe a book here and there. We didn't write op-eds. I mean, you know, almost never. We didn't, we didn't have blog posts. We didn't have Twitter. We didn't have anything like that. We were, and I think the focus on students was way more in 1991 than it is today, um, which is, I think, a shame. I agree with you. And, I, and you know, there's, there's a great debate about what the, what the value of a blog post is, what the value of, um, you know, what, what the value of Twitter is. Um, I think if we if we talk about what we mean by scholarship, and this is something we've really never had a conversation about, what do, what is scholarship? We have proxies for that, and you know where where you get published, how many times you get cited, how many times you get dealt. But we don't really talk about the quality of the of articles as much, and I think it's because there's too much of it. Um, I think we write too much actually, um, and so it's hard. I like to read things outside of my field. It's hard enough keeping up with things in my field. Do you want to tell people what your field is? Uh, underwater basket weaving law. There's a lot of articles about it. And, um, you know, some of it is not even about basket weaving. It's off, you know, oftentimes it's about plastic, well, you know, uh, baskets. And it's, it's really, you know, there's the tangential stuff. We don't even look at the interdisciplinary basket weaving literature because um, it's just not on West law. All right, I'm sorry I asked that question. That's not going to be the last time I'm, I'm sorry I asked the question. Um, I want to go back to scholarship for a minute. So Professor Hessek and I uh, um, have had heated discussions and debates about blog posts specifically. And you do write blog posts, and I write blog posts once a week. But the reality is I've written 30 blog posts on originalism. And if you take any 10 of those, there's an article in there and an essay. Um, some of my blog posts are read by 1,500 people, which probably is small by blog post numbers. But to me, I've written 50 law review, I've written like 45 law review articles. 1,500 people haven't read all 45 put together. So it seems to me a, well, a well-written series of blog posts should absolutely be something that law professors can at least think is worthwhile if we're trying to do scholarship. Your Your reaction? Well, I think there's a... Uh, well, first of all, I've, I've seen you and I've seen you and Professor Hessek argue. It, it doesn't it doesn't amount to a bar fight. I mean, you guys you guys, uh, you guys get a, a good discussion going, and I really enjoy your discussions. Uh, I, I was I was eavesdropping. Bar fight though, and we had a literal bar fight. I'm not a fight. Well, almost a fight, but we no, we were sitting. I met her when we were sitting in a bar in Chicago, and we were having this conversation, and um, we were drinking, and I don't drink, so that was bad. And uh, we ended up screaming and yelling at each other uh, quite a bit, um, which was kind of fun in public. But anyway, I was there. It was my, it was my symposium, and so I, I, I yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was definitely a, a vigorous exchange. But I think you both were, you, you both conducted yourselves professional. Uh, I, I, I want to correct the record there, but I. I I, the other thing I want to point out is the way you, way you characterize the blog post in your question, because you were suggesting that uh, a blog post perhaps 
does it contribute to scholarship? And the, I think the ultimate question is whether it is, right? Um, and I think that blog posts, much like law review articles, aren't created equal, right? So I could I could write a, a, a an article that is not seen by anyone. Pretty sure I've done that. Um, I've only done thirty of those, forty maybe. And I have blog posts that have been cited more than than articles I've written, and so um, and I think do make a contribution. So I think that's the first question we have to ask ourselves in this debate about what something is. Whether, Whether or not thing about, is, I'm sorry, go ahead, finish. I did just now while you were talking. The mustache is getting in the way of my brain. Um, one last thing about blog posts. So um, I'm having to do my annual, my, my, my five-year post-tenure report, um, which actually Georgia State takes a little bit seriously, which is nice. And to do that, I have to you know, account for a lot of things. My blog posts get cited all the time in law review articles. I mean, it's really interesting. Um, I, and I think they get cited for propositions of substance. I think that makes a difference. Um, I, I, you know, I, just like a law review article being cited. Anyway, that's just my view on it. Um, other things wrong with legal education? Well, I think the, the other thing that, we, that I've certainly taken a lot of heat for is the notion that uh, – how we hire in legal education is, is problem. <laughs> uh, and I, you know, we, we you know, I, I, I appreciate your work and uh, 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 Mila Markovic's work. And uh, I'm reading this really awesome book right now called Unequal Profession. Perhaps you've heard of it. Uh, and uh, and it's a uh, I, I I don't want to. Uh, I was thinking about writing a blog post about the book, but I just don't think I can do it justice yet. I have to think more. About it. There's a high, there's a hierarchy in legal education, and hierarchies are anti-intellectual. Right? So if we keep hiring from the same small group of schools, right, that's that doesn't equate to intellectual diversity, and it hardly equates to diversity the way those the schools are uh, uh, admissions run. So I have deep problems with that. Um, you had a great you you had a very good line um, for someone who wears a hat and a mustache. Um, Elite hiring is anti-intellectual. Is that what you said? What, what did you say? What did I want to use as a tag? What? Yes, um, hierarchy, hierarchies are anti-intellectual. Hierarchies are anti-intellectual. So let me give you. Let me give you because you've thought about this a lot. You've you've definitely been engaged on Twitter on this a lot with a lot of different people. Let me let me tell you what the folks at Harvard and Yale told me when I researched that article. The article I'm talking about is the elite teaching the elite. It was in the Journal of Legal Education. I did none of the math. I don't do math. Do you do math, by the way? Yes. Okay. Um, I should have. Okay. Well, I don't do math, but I had Adam Feldman, who does do math and is really good at it. He does it for Scotus blog and keeps data and all that stuff. And um, so when I found out this incredible number that 94.8% of tenured or tenure track law professors um, at the top 10 schools went to a top 10 school, (laughs) 94.8%, which I thought was an astounding number. I called up friends at Harvard and Yale and said, what do you guys think about liberals at Harvard and Yale? What do you think about this? This feels crazy to me. Their response was, hiring is hard. We all agree on that. I've done, you know, hiring is hard. We have thousands of applications, more than we could possibly go through. We can find everybody we need from those top 10 law schools. Going beyond that would be just too difficult and too time-consuming, and nobody has the energy to do it. To which I said, but you wouldn't feel that way about race or gender. And they said that's different. <laughs> well, you're not going to – you're not going – you can look at the faculty profile pages of most schools. I mean, I, I, I certainly don't want – I'm not saying that people from – top 10 schools are unqualified. That is not what I'm saying. I am saying the app. If you said that, we get this bot, more people would watch this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in trouble enough as it is. Um, it's diabolical. I'm sorry. I interrupted you. Go ahead. <laughs> but see, here's my, my, my problem is that the applicant pool ought to be broader. And there are people who are qualified to teach who are not from top 10 schools who have good scholarship, right? And being from a top 10 school does not guarantee that you have good scholarship. It merely guarantees that you will signal as if though you do, right? 
And so we use a whole bunch of proxies for this that have nothing uh, that have nothing to do. You know, they're proxies for quality that don't necessarily measure quality, and that has a uh, has a feedback loop. I don't I don't want to be in a I don't want to be in a university that has uh, you know 60 faculty members that all think uh, and I'm not suggesting everybody from Yale thinks the same way, but have had, all had the same training, have all had the same experiences in, in legal education, have all done those exact same things, because I find that misses a portion of the world. Let, let's maybe make a headline about Yale. Um, uh, I have a lot of friends at Yale Law School, um, and uh, you know Scott Shapiro and I have never met, but we have become as close as I think you can get on Twitter <laughs> with somebody. Um, oh my goodness, you're the girl in the DM. Well, no, it explains everything. Oh, wow. I had no idea. Okay, go on. Um, and I have other friends at Yale. And we can hold two ideas at the same time. Three. I have friends at Yale. As far as con law scholarship goes, I think a lot of it is great. And they have no conservatives. And if they had a reach that was larger than the top t- 10 law schools, or really in Yale's case, the top five, um, ranked, Harvard, Yale, Chicago, Stanford, Clinton. if they reached beyond those schools, they could hire conservatives. But they're not willing to do that. And that strikes me as just um, crazy to have a law school where there are no public law conservatives. I, can, I mean, by the way, my law school has no public law conservatives, and it drives me crazy. Um, well, that explains the mustache. But my, my, uh, my problem with this notion is I don't know what you mean by conservative or liberal. And I know the studies that have demonstrated if I vote, sorry, if I make a contribution to the Democratic Party, that makes me a liberal. And if I make a contribution to the Republican Party, that makes me conservative. And uh, I, I, I don't agree with that premise. Well, certainly no con law professor at Yale or at Yale would vote for Trump. Um, I don't think there are any at Harvard that would. Maybe Jack Goldsmith would, but I doubt it. Um, Maybe they would write an op-ed so they can get uh, for for President Trump, so they could get a, a clerkship or, or you know an internship for for one of their children. I, I think that's a possibility, don't you? Okay, I, that that wasn't on my list, but 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 <laughs> has shown through, and I'm happy to add that to my list because it's a great it's a great it's a great point. So here's here's here's. Uh, thought about conservative versus liberal. So I actually at a at a SEALs conference I You I, went to I, a conference with SEALs? Yeah, I know. That's right. Um either I got my SEAL of approval and uh, uh I was I was sitting next to a friend and I I decided I was going to have some fun with this friend by by asking the differences between uh George W. Bush and uh uh President Obama. And uh and so I walked through, uh, you know, uh, you know, Guantanamo was not closed. How do we feel about extraordinary rendition? Um, deportations came up. I talked about uh, drone strikes, right? Uh, we talked about antitrust policy. We talked about a whole host of things that I could see he was, you know, he was getting... Pause, pause. Law Prof blog was talking about antitrust policy? Isn't that a little bit beyond your sphere of, it, of, of knowledge? Well, yeah, it's not like it's a meaningful field that exists. I mean, it's not, there is antitrust. Didn't Judge Posner kill antitrust? Uh, no, no, no. Judge Posner did not kill antitrust. Uh, I would imagine if anybody got that, it would be maybe Judge Bork. But, um, but anyway, the whole point was there was very few, you know, in, in, the, in the scope of things I talked about. Uh, you know, I was, I was, I was constraining him into, you know, that this, that there were fact, not very many differences in those, in those topics. So if I, if I took a survey of, of, uh, professors across the land and I picked certain topics where I think one would be conservative and one would be liberal, I think I might find some, some greater view, you know, diversity of viewpoints. Maybe, but I will tell you that the con law faculty at Yale is 100% extremely liberal. Um, I, I want to go back to clerkships, though. So what happens is the people who get clerkships from Harvard and Yale, Chicago, a few other places, get the best clerkships, and then, when, and then they eventually get the best teaching jobs, 
And then they eventually teach other people who go through exactly the same route. And one of the things we noted in our article was that has a wildly discriminatory class component. This is where Hesek and I yelled at each other. Not saying there aren't people at Harvard, Yale, Chicago, Stanford, and Columbia that come from poor families. But there's no question that there are very few <laughs> uh, in, in numbers. Well, this is not a the, – the class issue, I think, is – I understand it's a, it's a hard issue and, and, and you know, because I know I know people um, who have really you know, had to struggle and, and got into you know Harvard, Yale uh, from 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 you know from uh, families who were who were not of good economic means. Uh, but it's I mean, Mark uh, Milan Markovitz's work, um, and, and by the way, you know, um, in my in my one author paper, I I, I draw the line and. You know that sequence of events creates significant barriers to people who are economically disadvantaged, and and so use of proxies, and at least in economics, is not a controversial thing if those proxies are well found. And I think I know a bit, but uh, I only only what I read from Judge Posner uh, and Cal Sunstein. You know, so uh, and those guys are never wrong, uh, right? So. Uh, but I, you know, the, the use of those proxies aren't—I don't think—controversial. I think Professor Markovitz's work uh, actually proves that. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, if there was one thing you could change about legal education, one, you're king of the world or queen of the world. Um, what would you do? I would kill the bar exam. <laughs> That's great. Tell me why. I don't think and I, I've been a, I've been at this position long before it became popular. Um, I would say for about. 20, 20 years now. Pause one second, uh, LPB. Five minutes, and the reason I'm, I'm pausing you is you've held this position longer than it's become popular. Five minutes before we started this podcast, and, this, and because you have been so conscious about this, that's why I'm bringing it up. Five minutes before I came in this room, Politico had a big article, eight justices would be best. <laughs> <laughs> was the first time anyone has ever expressed that idea. I'm sorry, world. I'm complaining. I admit it. But it was as if no one had ever expe- expressed this idea before. Um, you don't know how hard it is to avoid Eric when he's on those admissions. You know, you know, he's like, you want to catch some lunch and hear about the eight, people, eight justices I want to have on the Supreme Court? I'm like, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry Eric, I got to go. Uh, I got I, I to gotta go. Uh, no, no. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. And that, and that, that is, that's another problem with the legal academia. We're, we're very, we're very short-term memoried um, in terms of, you know, in terms of uh, the number of times I've seen theories come up, like, hey, this is the most brilliant idea ever. Oh, no, Twenty years ago, we talked about that in a different discipline. That's exciting. Um, but I think the bar exam doesn't do anything except torture people. It doesn't, um, especially now. I mean, it, it, it's it's very clear that, to me at least, that the whole point is to to make some make some money off of, of, of bar exams. Um, so do we have to have a bar exam? Absolutely, we must. You know why? Because because uh, we're told we need to. Uh, does it measure anything with respect to the quality of advocacy one might get after they pass the bar? Uh, no. Does it measure all the areas one might practice in? No. Does it measure anything except perhaps your memory retention at the time you took the bar? No. Does it? Uh, so there's there's no point to this, and people are really suffering. Um, just the the torture I see about you know just the the exam soft software. I mean, the costs clearly outweigh the benefits, especially now. It should not be. The- um, would you, so what would you say? If you graduate an accredited law school, you can be a lawyer or anybody can be a lawyer? Or how does it work? I think uh, I, I, I've thought about different means of doing that. Um, but, you know, you, you could have the law schools do a better job of, of maybe screening. If there's a question of someone's competency, maybe... Maybe they aren't passing certain classes or their grades in certain classes are not sufficient. Um, you know, in PhDs, they have qualifying exams for goodness sake, right? We could, we could do something along those lines. 
uh, where you're not spending two thousand dollars on barbering, and then hmm? you wouldn't say anybody can just be a lawyer just without any state. So does that mean? I'm curious how. Tell me how it works in the real in your real world. I talk about my fantasy world every day. <laughs> and, it's like kind of my professional thing. I talk about fantasy worlds um, where there are eight justices. Have I mentioned, have I mentioned that? Um, so what do you do? Uh, anybody can be a lawyer in Georgia, in my, my law school. Any, uh, the Georgia state has to put a, a seal of approval. If there's no bar exam, how does it work? There's many different options. I know that several, uh, several law schools have advocated for uh, – you know, some sort of uh, supervisory program, apprenticeship program. I, I, have, I have my own questions about that. Um, I think you could also do it with a with a some measure of screening, right? So um, you could have you could have certain required core courses that must be taken. Hey, that's like it is now, right? Um, you know, you could take a an overall qualifying exam before you graduate, right? And if you fail. We know exactly what you fail, as opposed to now, right? And if you if you're having trouble in that issue, then we we perhaps offer you some more services to get you competent in that area. Okay, you sold me. Kill the bar exam. Um, this morning, I was interviewed by a local news station asking me why are there no qualifications for Supreme Court justices in the Constitution, and why could and in fact, technically, non lawyers could be on, could be on the Supreme Court. Uh, I did a little bit of research into it, not a lot, but at the time of the founding and for about 70, 80, 90 years afterwards, most, I mean, lawyers didn't go to law school. They had apprenticeships and they had training and, and um, I don't think the founding fathers equated practicing law with graduating from a law school, not that I'm an originalist or anything, because I hear it's a matter of faith, but um, I do think that um, – we could live in that world again. It was good in 1789. We could live in that world. I think you're right. I think a combination of law school certification and a required apprenticeship would be a, a way to go. Well, see, now you're putting words in my mouth, Eric. I didn't say anything about the apprenticeship. I said that there, there have been some, some proposals. I don't necessarily subscribe to it. And one of the reasons I don't subscribe to it is because I think the the apprenticeship programs might have some disparity in terms of, of, of quality. Now you, you counter that and say, well, so do law schools, right? Exam. I mean, and and the, and the expense of the bar exam. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, uh, my, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little more concerned about what that would mean in terms of, uh, you know, conditions of bar with with respect to the apprentice, uh, the apprentice and 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 their supervisor. Um, at least with the law school, there's, you know, there's a great you know, some some uh, range of of, of of scorers who are, you know, checking your grades and making sure you're competent. All right. I have one more very serious question, and I, I mean that seriously, and then we're going to go to some questions that people on Twitter wanted me to ask you, which I think will be fun. But before we do that, you said kill the bar exams. I kind of want to kill the law reviews and start over. Um, Chris Sprigman and I wrote a piece that was supposed to go to online law reviews or like the Atlantic or Salon. I mean, it, it was written both ways. And we sent it out to a few of the law reviews, um, uh, but then we just, and, and one law review wrote back <laughs> with a list. This is a four thousand word, three thirty eight hundred word essay. They wanted us to make major changes, change things around, add things, delete and subtract, um, and then they would take it. And I'm like, no. First of all, I don't agree with three fourths of those things. Second of all. This letter was written in a tone that you can't even email. You can't even imagine. I mean, it, it, it was as if they knew more. I mean, you cannot imagine the tone of this email. Um, I think that's the exception rather than the rule, but it does point out the issue, one issue of student-run law reviews. Um, I've, had a, uh, I've had a three-hour conversation with this law journal. I'll remain, remain nameless about a footnote. <laughs> Three hours of a footnote? Yeah, and the person clearly thought they had an understanding of the topic in the footnote, and it was very clear to me that they did not. Um, but I had to, I had to engage in some teaching, and um, and it took some patience, you know, because you know, obviously, but but I'm used to this in, in a peer-reviewed world. This happens all the time, <laughs> right? But that's different, of course. How? 
That's because they are. Let me let me take a stab at this. Hold on. Let me think of the right word. Um, peers. Oh, that's the word I'm looking for. Peers. Well, look. You know, uh, I I think the students at law journals uh, in law journals do a very hard hard job. Uh, but I I think. I think again, this is the this is where we put the onus on others to do the hard work, right? Um, that's the reason. That's the reason legal writing professors and clinical professors are are amazing. I think they have the hardest job in in academia, and and yet they are treated very often like second class citizens. Um, I know you're immortal, so I know you were around. But do you know the history of why students run larvies? Uh, I assume that because the professors didn't want to anymore. Harvard had a law review, and the professors got tired of doing it, and they told the students to do it. And the students at first were like, oh, that's great. This is what I've heard anyway. That's great. Uh, then they wanted to give it back. And the professors said, uh-uh. Uh-uh. This is, this is, this is yours forever. Um, I, 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 if, you, if you allow me, um, in the months before the first big Obamacare case, I wrote a piece with a doctor, like a real doctor, like a doctor of medicine. Um, I did the law part. He did the health care part. He's actually, uh, and he's, well, I'm not going to name him, but well, I, you can look it up. But anyway, I, we did this piece. And um, Stanford took it for its online law review, which was nice. Um, and then they wanted to gut most of the legal stuff which is bad enough, but they were second guessing the doctor's like healthcare medical stuff. Um, and we actually had to threaten to pull it, um, which I did. Um, and then, and that, and that worked and then they let, and they published the article. But I mean, it's, I just don't know how we're in that world where law students at Stanford are questioning a doctor's factual takes on healthcare. It's just, it's just crazy. All right. Um, I have well, some. Well, well, before we get to that, let me just say, uh, this is one of the things that's that's problematic about how we view scholarship, right? Um, you know, it, it's it, it and it cuts both ways. Like, I, I I've seen I've seen vigorous defense of someone's scholarship because it was published in a Yale Law Journal, um, and that person happened to be a white male, and I've actually seen a horrible takedown of someone's scholarship published in Yale Law Journal when that person happened to be a black female. So the, the presumption of, and this is why Unequal Profession is a great book, the presumption of, um, the presumption of competence uh, shifts, and that's anti-intellectual too, right? It's, one ba it's bad enough thing to use an imperfect proxy for quality. It's another one to shift it in, a, in, a, in such a discriminatory fashion. And that's why I don't like this. I don't. I agree with you. I don't like the law review business for that, for that, uh, for that reason. The other reason is uh, people can publish the same things over and over without respect for what people have published in the past. Can you name an article from the 1940s that uh, that really is meaningful today? My book, Originalism as Faith, cites. In the 1940s, you're that old. Holy cow! Cites a 1939, not one article, not two articles, not three articles, a five-part series um, in the California Law Review by Jacobus Tenbrock that says everything about originalism and legal realism anybody would ever want to know. And all, all I, and, and, and of course, there have been scholars since then who have taken different roads and avenues. But as far as the basic argument between legal realists and non-legal realists and original. He said everything in 1939, and my book in, in, in many chapters is derivative and updating his work. Um, I've always said, uh, LPG, that there are very few people, uh, I mean, you can do this, saying something original in constitutional law that's not stupid is unbelievably hard. It's unbelievably hard. Um, and that's the way it is. So if, if that's the case, so, so I mean, that, that brings in the question why we're doing this, right? So I think it... I like to think we're doing this to make the world a better place, but I think our, a lot of our, our good intentions get lost in the in the transom. I mean, I, I mean, I you know, sure, I remember Felix Cohn's article, right? Um, but but 
know, there's so darn few of those that we still pay tribute to. And so if 50 years after I'm dead, I'm kind of wondering if, if anyone's going to cite me at all. And, and if, uh, well, at some point, everyone does. And you know, I, I thought maybe you were different. Oh, uh, yeah, going to pass the baton to, to, to a, a younger, more clever version of myself, which, 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 which would not be very difficult. You know, I, but, I, I have been fighting over the last three years to dispel an idea put forward by a Chicago law professor and a Duke law professor. Both, they, agree, they, read, they write things together. Uh, and, and, when, and, and they both are amazing scholars who have written amazing scholarship except for when it comes to originalism, where they are very, both very strange. And they both have taken the position that Brown and Obergefell can, maybe can be justified as originalist decisions. And of course, they can't be. Um, no matter what Michael McConnell says, they can't be. Um, and uh, But they got traction because they're at Chicago and Duke. And if someone at Syracuse had written that Obergefell might be an originalist decision because the people who wrote and ratified the 14th Amendment expected it to be applied by judges um, over time in an updated fashion, depending on modern conditions, that person from Syracuse would have been laughed out of the legal academy. Um, yeah, I, see, I think it's important. I think it's important to weigh ideas. And I don't, when I, when I hear, I, I mean, there are people I admire and respect who I vehemently disagree with. Um, you know, I respect these two. Don't get me wrong; they know that. I mean, I, you know, so you know, I've had I've had great debates with uh, with uh, Professor Hasek. I've had great debates with you. I've had great debates with uh, with uh, other people, and I learn from each and every one of them. And so I, I I'm always appreciative. Of this. Um, I don't like the notion that um, you can dismiss someone's claims because of where they're from. But that happens. And, that happens. Yeah, it does. And that's why every time I get in a heated debate, someone wants to say, you know you what, you need to stop being anonymous. And, uh, and it's funny how that happens. It's almost like, yeah, if you stop being anonymous, then we can start attacking you and not the ideas. And, you know, and that might make it easier on your opponent. It's just not fair. Like, well, no, that's not how it works. You should attack my ideas. And in fact, go for it. You know, people do that all the time. You know? I think that's a great point. It, it, it would be interesting if all law reviews really did go to blind review completely. Even the ones that do blind review don't really do blind review. But it would be interesting if they all did. Um, I, I think the results in the elite law reviews would be very different than they are now. Even on second reads? Completely anonymous, yeah. You think they'll be completely anonymous to the professors in the field who are reading those pieces? No, they can't be. Yeah, and in fact, they could probably search on SSRN because people are eagerly post posting their their paper. Another conversation. Why in the world we need law reviews with SSRN is a whole different conversation. All right, enough of this. Enough of this. I want to ask you some other questions. How did the stupid two spaces after a period start? And by the way, you're wrong, wrong, wrong. You couldn't be more wrong on this. Oh my God, it's wrong. No, 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 no. See, my point is, so people think I ultimately care whether it's one space or two. That is not my battle. My battle, no, my battle is that at some point it was two spaces and the standard was changed with notice or comment and moreover the argument is that it was because typewriters died well i have to tell you for those of us who wrote in the 90s we we're still two spacing it was then the typewriters were already dead right so if we're going to change standards it ought to be the case that we are consistent in that and that we all have some discussion of changing those standards. Stakeholders, writers, right? Uh, I tell you what, Eric, why don't we go around changing election law just on a whim, right? Um, I, I, well, so someone asked me, are you, pro or con, are you pro or con the 2020 election? I am, 
I am always pro-democracy and pro-voting, assuming the voting is transparent and also uh, consistent. In other words, uh, I, I don't like to see issues of voter suppression. I don't actually like to see, uh, I, I want everyone to have an opportunity to vote. And so if it, it raises my ire uh, if, if there's barriers to that. What happens to you when your ire is raised? Probably sarcasm and some wine, uh, depending. I mean, if, it, if it's, I don't go writing in things that I, I think are well beyond my wheelhouse. Um, you know, if if uh, I, I tend to try to stay in things that I, I'm actually, you know, fairly well trained in, um, and so, uh, but so I don't I don't comment a lot on election law, and also I grew up in a family that we, we you know really smart people who uh, disagreed and argued vehemently. And, but it never got vitriolic. Uh, you know, uh, I, I have been, I have been a Republican. I have been a Democrat. Say what? I have been a Republican and I have been a Democrat. And today? I am not a member of any party. <laughs> um, all right, wait, hold on. Back to grammar for a minute. I can maybe live with your two spaces after a period originalism, though I think you'd be well advised to adopt the, the Randy Barnett living originalism kind of, he wouldn't call it that, but that's what it is. Um, the, 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 now, right? <laughs> he was very nice to have me in his class yesterday. So um, the updating of um, the period, but the Oxford comma, I, comma, I cannot countenance. There has to be a comma there. There has to be, otherwise it looks stupid. Your position is? I agree. I, I, I am pro-Oxford comma. So why do people think you're inconsistent among those two? People say that you are inconsistent in being against one space after a period, but being in favor of the Oxford comma. Why? I don't know why, but people make that. People have made that charge. That's that's not inconsistent at all because both of those things were and are standards, and and we we have we have maintained those. We only has shifted. And I am not being the inconsistent one. And now, you know, it's kind of funny. People are advocating against the elimination of the Oxford comma. And the same people who are for single spacing after a period are all of a sudden going, wait, wait a second. We tried that. Right. Oh, really? Welcome to my world. Yep. Um, I have a sense. I have a sense of your world. And I think it's a world I better stay away from mostly. This is this is a. Uh, this is, the, this is the extent of me entering your world, I think. Although it's kind of fun, I have to say. Um, hold on. More questions from Twitter. This is a big one. And, there's an, uh, and this is another one where I have a very strong opinion. Are hot dog sandwiches? See, um, if you go back and watch the uh, uh, it was, uh, Colbert and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, if I recall. I don't know. I don't. And so uh, he, he asks for the question, are hot dog sandwiches? And people misinterpret this as her saying, yes, they are. But, but in fact, what she says is, how do you define the sandwich? And he defines it. And then she says, well, according to your, inter you know, your definition, it is a sandwich, right? So uh, using that sort of statutory interpretation, I would imagine the question is what we mean by sandwich. And uh, What do you mean by sandwich? You're ducking these. You'd be a good politician. You've been ducking all my questions, a lot of them. Uh, no, I, uh, you know, don't even think about making me a dean somewhere. I, I think that would add for everyone. You know, if we're talking about a, well, you know, it's hard to say because sandwiches do come with uh, things that are wrapped in three sides. And so a hot dog would, in a bun, would be a, a sandwich under that definition. So, yeah. Are you saying it's indeterminate? I am suggesting that it, it is, uh, in all probabilities, a sandwich. I'm going to have to agree. Take, good. Okay. Um, by the way, the, uh, a videotaped clip, which I'm assuming we could find somewhere, of Colbert and Ginsburg having that conversation about a sandwich being misinterpreted by people in the same time span, six months, a year or two years afterwards, says all a lot about originalism. But we'll leave that conversation for a different Wow. Well, yeah. I'm the straw man to your originalist banter here. I am. Uh, I'm offended. All right, um, we got to go in a minute. Unfortunately, a couple more things. Um, Instapots. Now, so my wife is a gourmet cook, 
Um, and she does the cooking. And, I mean, she's also a business school professor, but she is an amazing cook. I, I cook macaroni and cheese, and I cook uh, spaghetti. Um, but you are apparently strongly against the Instapot? It is. Well, uh, you know, any sort of pressure cooking or slow cooking apparatus uh, can can also anything you cook in there, you can probably cook better without it. Um, I've, heard, I've heard arguments that yes, you know, it's easier to cook beans in them uh, in those, and I, I, I'm willing to grant that exception. But for I think I think it's just another thing to clutter your kitchen, and it and it, it doesn't produce it doesn't produce. Uh, food that uh, that I would consider, and this is going to get me in a lot of trouble, more so than anything else I've said, edible. <laughs> Hold on. Food coming out of the Instapot on many occasions, or most occasions, or all occasions, is inedible? Is that what you just said? Yeah, I, I'm not. That's fine. That's good. I, no, <laughs> LPB ratings. That's what we're going for here. I mean, come on. All right, um, so I think this is my last one, maybe. Um, then I have I have a, a funny question, and then I have a serious question, and then we'll say goodbye. Uh, sweatpants as as work pants? What's that about? What, what the pe- well, I am. Uh, I believe that if you uh, if you're dressing for class, it, it, you know, uh, a tuxedo and a top hat are really the only only answers. Um, Regardless of gender, I think this is this is a timeless classic look that everyone should 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 stand by. But you know, I don't set those rules. Um, you know, in terms of a Zoom environment uh, where everyone is now classrooming, apparently, um, you know, I think it's important to look, um, you know, awake. Um, uh, you know, apart from that, I don't really, I don't have any objection. You don't. So. Do you still think a top hat and a mustache is the way to go after seeing this? <laughs> Not so much the mustache. I, I think that that this the, the top hat does look, I think, classy on you. Um, um, but, uh, I, you know, the, the the mustache makes me think you're going to get a cane and do a Charlie Chaplin impression later. <laughs> I don't think you have the acting chops for that. Um. I want to, I know, uh, okay, so this is no secret. I know who you are. I know both of your identities. I respect both of them tremendously. Um, I think the world sucks right now really badly. And um, it sucks in a lot of different ways. Um, But I think a big part of that suckiness is that it's very, very hard to have political conversations with people on the other side these days. Whereas it used to be, Not that hard. And I have so many friends, so many, who say I can't talk to my sister or I can't talk to my, you know, my my, my dad or I can't I can't talk to my wife's my my wife's best friend or whatever, because we're so freaking divided. I mean, it's 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 like the whole left of center, right of center, which is is gone. It's 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 gotten further. It's gotten more extreme. And I think one of the reasons is. Um, you can't. I think there's a there's a there's a quickness to to label, and as opposed to understand. And so I I have I have many a relative who are are uh, very strong advocates for either political party, and I I I can debate them civilly, but I never but I don't label them. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've also had discussions when we used to go to bars. Remember those days? Um, you know, someone goes, what are you, a freaking commie? Uh, what do you think a communist is? Right. And the minute you get beyond that label and trying to figure out what those what those labels are, it, it, that, that, it, it, it demonstrates they have no idea. Uh, so we're very quick to label someone either a fascist or uh, a communist and and you see the you see the leaders of these political parties doing this too, and that's why I, if I have anything political to say is I don't like political parties. I think they're a terrible idea. I don't like duopoly. I think it provides terrible service. Right? I can get my cable from a cable company or from from a phone company, my internet, and either way, it's going to suck. Yeah. 
So you you with the founding fathers on political parties? I, I, I yeah, I'm not. Uh, I no, I don't. I, I, I am more of a European in that sense. I want to resolve. I want to dissolve Parliament every so often. <laughs> we can't get a, get a quorum going. Then yeah, I want to dissolve Parliament. Yep. Um, you know, Thomas Jefferson thought we should have a new constitution every 18 years or 12 years or something. Um, there's something to that. Anyway, um, all right. Uh, this has been an enormous pleasure. I was kind of hoping at the end of this you'd reveal your secret identity, and that would really get headlines, but I'm not going to ask you to do that. I'm not going to ask you. I'm Eric Siegel. Sorry? I said I'm Eric Siegel. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, thank you, LPB. This was awesome, and I really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Eric.